deny yourself. Last week, Jesus took the disciples to a seaside resort and quietly asked them, who do you say that I am? You remember? And the answer came back from Simon Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Six verses later, as Linda just shared with us, Jesus has a game plan. He began to show his disciples that he must travel to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and then on the third day be raised. So the same Peter took Jesus aside and said, God forbid it, Lord. And Jesus turned his full wrath upon Simon Peter, upon that same Peter. Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me, for you are setting your mind on human things and not divine things. Jesus says to his followers, who I am is a divine secret. Keep it to yourselves. But you are to act as if you know who I am. You are to act as if you know what I have come to do. Take up your cross and follow me. Don't be afraid to lose your life for my sake, because it is in the losing of your life that you will find it and find me again. According to theologian Edith Humphrey, Jesus does not speak of the wonders of the resurrection so much, but he does point his disciples to the paradoxical power of the cross. One must put to death everything that impedes the new life of God. This is the meaning of taking up one's cross. Jesus underscores human participation when he speaks of the time when the Son of Man will reward each one of us for being faithful. Those who lose their life for my sake, they will find it. Somehow, the uniqueness of Jesus' action on the cross and our participation and our faith in Jesus, our belief in Jesus, it all works together. The question of who Jesus is leads inevitably to our own identity and role as disciples. In his description of what it means to follow him, Jesus constantly directs us toward divine things rather than human things. But we are like Peter, aren't we? We have trouble putting aside our pursuit of human things. We strive to be independent. We strive to be self-made and self-reliant, getting ahead and getting enough to live more and more comfortably and live on our own. That's our goal. We want to be church. Yes, we want to be church. We want to meet together. We want to raise our voices in our sanctuary. We want to be together where community is strong and that community feeds our spiritual needs and the needs of those we love. We prefer a faith that encourages individualism rather than the old rugged. Preacher Joseph Harvard III says, we want a muscular brand of faith that is committed to being number one and victorious over all our foes. Pretty much how we approach everything in life, isn't it? But that old hymn that we don't sing so much anymore, but was so beautifully referenced by Amanda in our song, it still haunts us. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of sorrow, the emblem of suffering and shame. The cross. The cross represented the power of the Roman Empire to demonstrate at a moment's notice who was in charge. Like the American slave owner, Willie Lynch, who developed the ability to control all American slaves through lynching, it was an emblem of suffering and shame. 
But Jesus calls us to take that emblem of suffering and shame and bear it proudly on our spiritual journey. Any of you listened to the governor this week? He had a lot to say. He laid out very convoluted rules about opening up our public places. And as he laid out those rules trying to figure out, and we tried to figure out where our church fits in, you and I watched this week as one party gathered close together to nominate a candidate. We also watched as tens of thousands of people gathered 57 years later around the MLK statue just down the street from the White House, also in Washington. And neither group practiced much social distance safety. In March 1961, concern for a different kind of safety Episcopal seminarian Jonathan Davis answered the call of a then very much alive Martin Luther King, who recruited, who recruited students and clergy to join the movement in Selma, Alabama. Some of you remember that. To take part in the march for voting rights from Selma to the state capital of Montgomery. Daniels and several other seminary students left for Alabama on Thursday, in, intending to just stay the weekend. So after Daniels and his friend Judith Upham uh, missed the bus home from Selma, they had, uh, they had second thoughts about their short stay. The two returned to the seminary just long enough to request permission to spend the rest of the semester working in Selma, where they would also study on their own and return at the end of the term to take exams. Well, in Selma, uh, Daniels stayed with the Wests, who were a local African-American family. During the next four months, Daniel worked to integrate the local Episcopal church by taking groups of young African-Americans to the church. The church members were not welcoming. But Daniels persevered and in May, Daniels returned to the seminary to take his semester exams and he passed. Daniels returned to Alabama in July to continue his work. He helped assemble a list of federal, state, and local agencies that could provide assistance for those in need. He also tutored children. He helped poor locals apply for aid, and he worked to register voters. And that summer, on August 2nd, 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act which would provide broad federal oversight and enforcement of the constitutional right to vote. Before that, Blacks had been effectively disenfranchised across the South since the turn of a century. I have not ever asked my uh, family when they could first vote. On August 14, 1965, 55 years ago this month, Daniels was one of a group of 29 protesters who went to Fort Deposit, Alabama to picket, its, uh, to picket its whites only stores. All of the protesters were arrested and they were transported in a garbage truck to jail in the nearby town of Hainville. The group was held for six days in a facility which lacked air conditioning. Finally, on August 20th, the prisoners were released. Daniels with three others, a white Catholic priest and two black female activists, walked to buy a cold soft drink at nearby Varner's Cash Store, one of the few local places to serve non-whites. But barring the front was Tom L. Coleman, an unpaid special duty uh, deputy who was holding a shotgun and held a pistol and a holster. Coleman threatened the group and leveled his gun at 17-year-old uh, black young lady by the name of Ruby Sales. Daniels pushed Sales down and caught the full blast of the shotgun. He was instantly killed. Well, Jonathan Daniels was proclaimed a martyr by the Episcopal Church. All of the young seminarians' papers were read and examined. 
they found these words. Jonathan Daniels wrote, during my time in Selma, I noticed a profound change in myself. The documents of the creeds, the enacted faith of the sacrament, uh, sacraments were the essential preconditions of the experience itself. The faith which, which I went to Selma had not changed. It had grown. I began to know in my bones and my sinews that I was being truly baptized into the Lord's death and resurrection, along with people of all races, all life, in him whose name is above all names that the races shout, we white people, black people, all people, we are unspeakably one. The cross. Resurrection is a marvelous, victorious place. That is why every worship service proclaims, every Lord's Day proclaims resurrection. However, we can't get there until we have laid down every care that so easily besets us and take up the cross of Jesus. I invite you to prepare to respond to this message as we pray. Humility is a very difficult thing for us, Lord. We have been so privileged to be born and live in a country with so many possibilities and so many opportunities and so many ways to be individuals, to forge our way, to be our own person. The idea of humbling ourselves before you and putting away the things that we love to do so much to follow you is very difficult for us but it is what you call us to do. And so during this time of quarantine, during this time of unrest, help us put aside our own agendas so that we may more clearly see to follow you. In your son's name we pray, amen.